Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. 2018 was a pretty good year for games. I played a lot of them myself, and uh, despite the fact that it is 2019, in this video I'll be going through my top 10 games of 2018. So let's get this countdown started. Number 33. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't like it. I've never played a traditional non-action command-based JRPG before outside of Pokemon, and from the little I saw of Persona 4 and from the reviews of Persona 5, I thought this would be a good jumping in point for this type of game, and who oh boy did I learn my lesson. Look, I know this was the game of 2017 for a lot of you, and I think it would have been for me as well if the game ended after, say, Kamashita's Palace. The game, to its credit, did set an intriguing tone in its first few hours, and I don't think I've ever played a game with as much swagger as Persona 5. I think the graphic design and user interfaces spoiled me on just about every other video game UI because there are elements about this game's style that is best of all time material for me. The music is just so good, too. I mean, just listen to this. I wanted to adore this title, but after hour 15, just about everything Persona 5 threw at me began to feel like a grind. Persona 5's brand of combat became so incredibly tedious for me to the point where I would actively try to sneak around fights, not because I didn't want to use my SP, but because I felt like I was wasting an extraordinary amount of time repeating the cycle of target weakness, all out attack, and repeat. And yes, after watching hundreds of battles go by, I definitely saw it coming. The live sim stuff was probably the strongest part about this game for me, but even that always felt at odds with the time limit given to the main story missions and your cat telling you to go to bed after a long day of doing an activity that would take most people five minutes to complete. I felt like in order to get to the parts of the game that I actually enjoyed, I was forced to grind through dungeons in one or two days of in-game time if I wanted any hope of actually forming a social life. It took me 89 hours to beat Persona 5, and the longer it went on, the less I enjoyed it. I know that long of a runtime is standard for Persona games, but compounding on my issues with the combat, the pacing just kind of took a complete nosedive when you got to around the middle sections of the game and never really recovered. There were entire chapters and main party members that I thought could have been axed from the game entirely to make a more reasonably paced experience. So. Despite a few genuinely interesting story beats, the user interface, the music, and some decently fun social link encounters, Persona 5 takes the bottom spot on this list as the game that I enjoyed playing the least this year. Number 32. Supergiant Games is my favorite indie game studio. Bastion was one of my favorite games of the last generation, and Transistor is among my favorite games of all time. So when I got word that these folks were whipping up another game, I got myself nice and sticky in preparation for whatever they had coming down the pipeline. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to shield me from what Pyre ended up being, which was a personally unsatisfying game that didn't quite equal the sum of its parts. First, the good. As always, Supergiant knocked it out of the park with some superb art direction. The character design for this game is some of the best and most varied that they've ever created. And they paid so much attention to the world that they had to create an entire grimoire to contain the insane amount of lore that the Pyreverse had in store for its players. Unfortunately, that's where the game stops clicking for me. I was halfway into Pyre's lore book before I realized that, wow, I just don't care about any of the events happening in this game and in a game that is probably majority story, I think that's not exactly a ringing endorsement. I think Pyre's gameplay is diverse and can be interesting in the right hands, but I found the actual experience of playing the game to be incredibly disappointing. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay felt clunky, boring, and easily solved by using faster characters. I played on normal difficulty and thought it was way too easy, losing only one of the rights my entire playthrough, I attempted it on higher difficulties and turned on some of the modifiers, but never found a distinct balance between actual challenge and frustratingly unfair. Pyre also goes through great pains to make you feel like you're making grand sacrifices by forcing you to lose your best player over and over again, 
but that impact goes bye-bye when you can easily slot out a Sir Gilliam for a Rookie or a Tizo and feel basically zero impact. I didn't care much for the idea that I was the coach of a team in the WNBA, and that I was also coaching the Pyre equivalent of the Golden State Warriors, slotting me in the NBA Finals just about every season no matter what. I understand the story reason behind this decision, and also that this was done to help others play the game to conclusion no matter what their skill level, but a new game plus or other setting that actually makes the regular season rankings actually matter would go a long way in creating the type of player-driven permanence that Supergiant wanted to drive home. A few final words on Pyre, I think the music is probably the least good out of the Supergiant catalog. It's still good, but it features tracks with lyrics that are a bit too on the nose and specific to the game for my liking. Traversing the overworld was also a bit of a disappointment, and I thought this game would have been a lot better if maybe there were some interesting minigames like the one from Bay's Introduction of Your Party. Number 31. I got this game on PlayStation Plus and played it when I got a wild hair about clearing my backlog earlier in the year. I didn't exactly know what rhyme was when I first booted it up, but was quickly greeted with a really good looking cell shaded graphical style in the van of Wind Waker but I quickly realized that that is probably the best part of the game. Rhyme is a puzzle exploration game where most of the puzzles are fairly easy. You'll see the same type of put the balls in the right place to open the door type puzzles in a few places, and the whole experience feels a little disjointed and boring. You can tell that they were trying to go for some kind of emotional type of feeling that you got when you played Journey for the first time, but at least Journey had a through line that really made you want to discover the world and piece together the cryptic story they put forward. Rhyme's story, on the other hand, ends in a bit of an emotional gut punch that isn't really all that well earned, but hey, it's a really easy platinum if you follow a guide, and overall, I didn't dislike Rhyme. I didn't like Rhyme, I just sort of nothinged it, which is why it is where it is on this list. Number 30. So the thing that I liked most about the first season of the late Telltale's Batman series is that it isn't a Batman story at all, it's a Bruce Wayne story. Telltale's style definitely lent itself better to the playboy philanthropist politician so well to the point that it was actually kind of a drag when it was finally time for the Dark Knight to show up. They tried to play more on Batman's detective skills, but even that ended up playing like a very rudimentary game of collecting all of the objects of interest and linking the two most obvious ones together to advance the plot. There were a few points in the story where you could make your Bruce Wayne hilariously contradictory, definitively swearing off a potential love interest earlier in the game, but as suddenly turning it around a few hours later to profess your undying love for them near the finale. While I thought the story was well written enough, and this is probably the best that a Telltale game has ever looked outside of Tales from the Borderlands and uh, The Walking Dead final season, the performance is woefully inadequate for the fidelity that the game is trying to push. I also still felt like no matter my choices, just about everything was always going to end up the same way, which makes sense considering that there is a sequel out there that this game had to build to, but it does really kneecap the intensity of Batman the Telltale series. Say hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Well, I tee him up and he knocks him down. That's how Mr. Wayne and I do business. Number 29. Totally Accurate Battlegrounds was the first game that I played on my Twitch channel. Originally, it was supposed to be a test of my settings and whatnot, but because this was the first Battle Royale game that I had ever played, I was pretty quickly enraptured by the concept of 40 or so noodly beings being launched out of a conga line of semi-trucks onto an island to fight for supremacy. I got the basic battle royal experience of looting, shooting, and eventually dying, but one thing I didn't really expect was the sheer terror of the whole thing. Because of the scale of the map and number of players, totally accurate battlegrounds, and by extension, all battle royals, have much more of a sense of permanence and finality than your standard last man standing game mode. When you kill someone in this game, you aren't sending them back to a respawn screen, you're straight up booting them off the server. You're sending your victims straight back to the title screen. But unfortunately, the noodliness of your noodle person doesn't stop at appearances. 
everything you do in Tab G has this unsettling elasticity to it. Aiming down the sights and shooting feels way too loose. Guns and equipment are a bit too sparse for my liking, leading to the majority of my games feeling like I spent most of my time under-equipped. And I don't think the map is designed all that well, but you know, all that criticism does kind of fall away when you do get a kill here and there, because despite how poor the shooting feels, man, there's nothing like surviving a firefight in the battle royale genre. Is that a weapon? <gasps> Look at this thing! I did it. Boy, people are gonna wish that they didn't mess with me. Oh, shit! <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> Number 28. I think I like Mad Max a lot more than the rank I'm giving it implies. The repetitive mission design and hand-to-hand -hand combat is probably the weakest part of this title. Enemies wait their turn to get beat up, and you may eventually get to counter someone who tries to step out of line. That's not to say that Assassin's Creed or Batman style of combat is bad, I just don't think it, at the least in this game, allows for much player creativity. I think the same issues pop up a bit too much here in this game, but the saving grace is Mad Max's great open world. But you may ask yourself, isn't that just a desert? And to that, I'd say yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a sandbox in every sense of the word. Avalanche Studios went above and beyond to make everything feel ripped out of the Mad Max films, from the tone, story, enemy designs, and the reliance and deity-like importance of cars. Most importantly, they give car combat the gravitas that the Mad Max license expects. While I think that car combat in this game is still somewhat mechanically simple and probably a bit too plentiful, I think it does justice to what the core of Mad Max is. It's a good game, get it for cheap if you liked that new Mad Max movie. You'll probably have at least a little bit of fun here. Uh -oh. No war boys left. Just you and me. Number 27. So, a quick caveat for this one, I haven't played too much of Human Fall Flat solo. I have another channel where I sporadically upload Let's Play footage between me and my buddy Matt, and thank goodness because I think that Human Fall Flat would end up much lower on this list if I had to play it by my lonesome. The controls are frustrating by design, which is where a lot of this game's humor comes from, in a quap or octodad sort of way. As far as the puzzles go, it can be somewhat easy to miss the lever you need to pull or the door you need to open to get to the next area of the game. But when playing in split screen, Human Fall Flat becomes one of the best examples of a slapstick video game humor in recent years. Those frustrating controls end up being the harbinger of a lot of laughs as your little doughboys flail around, accomplishing impossible tasks like walking upstairs, grabbing onto things, and jumping. And when you're contemplating searching for the next puzzle, who can blame you if you give your nice friend a little push over the edge into an infinite abyss? The biggest problem with Human Fall Flat comes when the laughs stop and the frustration of trying to knock a lock off the door or trying to grab onto a rope to Tarzan across a gap begins. That's not helped by the odd audio design choices in Human Fall Flat. There's only two or three minute long tracks separated by a weirdly long amount of silence. Once again, I think you should probably play this with friends, and even then, yeah, Gang Beasts is probably a better buy. Okay, can you, can you, that's terrible. Oh, you broke it. Oh, oh no. Oh my god. It's a ramp. We're Dude. idiots. Jesus Christ. Number 26. So we have two games back to back that I played in co-op for the most part. As a fighting game guy by nature, I was drawn to Absolver's unique fighting system that features a surprising amount of customization. I've seen comparisons to Dark Souls, but I actually think there's a bit more in relation here to a For Honor, which still gets a lot of comparisons to Dark Souls. I think that probably sounded better in my head. The sound design is the star of the show here. Impact's sound is weighty and squishy as they look. An Absolver is at its best when your attacks flow as well as they possibly can when you're putting together the right moves. But I think defensive options could use some improvements to make the act of defending a bit more fun. 
and the way you're supposed to cancel moves into other moves doesn't work as well when you're playing online. Also, PvP is a bit of an uphill climb for a new player considering your level, equipment, and moves transfer from single player to multiplayer. Absolver has reached that point where people playing Absolver have gotten really good at Absolver, causing you to run into a brick wall of feet and fists without much recourse on your end. The game is also slightly let down by its open world based story mode. They don't do a great job of shuttling you from mini boss to mini boss, leading me and my buddy to get lost multiple times in what is actually a fairly small open world. They recently released a big batch of new content, so it may be worth checking out if it's sitting somewhere in your PlayStation Plus library. Absolver was a very fun game with intriguing mechanics for the time that I played it, but the gameplay loop just wasn't strong enough to keep me going for that long. Number 25. The way Epic Games has supported Fortnite is nothing short of phenomenal. From in-game events, map changes, weapon additions, new gameplay mechanics, and a bustling and creative community, this should be a game I am head over heels with, but unfortunately, I'm not. While I don't think there's anything wrong with how Fortnite plays, it, it just didn't get its hooks on me. But why? Well, I'm just not the biggest fan of the building. Believe me, I've tried pretty hard to get my mind around building better structures, but I'm just so far behind everyone else that I just don't find it fun when I do get the drop on another player and they build an entire small town complete with local government in response. There was a time when I thought that building should be removed or limited in Fortnite, but during my time with the game, I realized that building is just so critical to what the game is, and without it, the map loses its entire sense of verticality and becomes just another boring battle royal. I still generally have a pretty good time with Fortnite, but it's this low on the list because I'm just kind of turned off on the game when I see highlights of some crazy twitchy build fight. I just see it as a mess. It's unfortunate too, because I really just hate missing out on the insanity that is the biggest video game on earth. Number 24. It may not look like much, but the simple graphical style of 2015's Downwell quickly gives way to a fun and engaging blend of arcade shooter, reverse platformer, and roguelike. The power-ups are meaningful and impactful, and I really like the heart reserve system as an incentive for collecting hearts and not taking damage. Controls are tight, the visuals are crisp, clear, and understandable, and I think there's something to say about a game this small having game design this smart. I actually don't have that much more to say about it beyond that. It's super cheap and just about on every console you can think of, but if you're gonna pick it up on my suggestion, absolutely get it on a mobile platform. I went back and forth on including mobile games in this year's list before ultimately deciding against it, but if I did, this would be the best mobile game that I played this year. Number 23. If you haven't heard of Laser League before, it's a 3v3 arena combat game where you fight with light. You run over markers on a map that activate a wall of light, and if your opponent runs into them, they are eliminated. Take them out before they take you out, and you win the set. Laser League ended up being my 2018 game that I picked up whenever I had 5 or so minutes to spare for gaming in a given day. Each class can be outfitted with a number of offensive or defensive tools, which turns somewhat of a simple concept into a decently considered game of virtual tag. I thought that some of the power-ups gave me an interesting choice of going to activate lights or racking up kills with my weapon. Visually, I actually think that Laser League looks a little plain. I generally like the Tron-style aesthetic, but I don't think they do much with it here, which is a bit of a disappointment, considering that the gameplay can be as fun as it is. Sort of like its rocket-based cousin, some of the most intense white-knuckle moments of my gaming year came from this title when I was 5-6 to six minutes into a game-deciding round, the walls are going incredibly fast, the music is pumping, my heart is racing, I'm running around picking up clutch revives, eliminations, activating lasers, getting eliminated, and hoping beyond hope that my teammates come to pick me up. And at that point, win or lose, I find myself just having a simply great time. Number 22.
Horizon Zero Dawn feels like a 7 out of 10 game with some fantastic ideas that, if refined in a sequel, could be the start of one of the best franchises of all time. Each robot enemy encounter was a clever testing of my knowledge of a well-crafted combat system that integrates smart movement, well-placed aim, enemy knowledge, and environmental usage. While I can't say the same for combat against human opponents, elements of this combat system work so well that I'm excited to see what the next iteration of this series has in store. Guerrilla Games' vision of a post-post-apocalyptic future kept me intrigued in the how and why of a far-flung American Midwest throughout my time with the game. While Aloy felt like more of a vehicle for the player to project themselves on with a little personality of her own outside of Determined, I think Horizon Zero Dawn is at its best when they focus on the societies, tribes, and customs of this new world, and how it all unravels to reveal exactly why this new world came to be. With all that said, it's unfortunate how, despite a supremely solid core, Horizon couldn't quite stick the landing around its edges. While beautiful to look at and rich with potential to tell an amazing story, the open world that Aloy inhabits is just so lifeless and paint by numbers that at times, it feels like I was playing a late 2000s Ubisoft game. The side content that populates the world results to not much more than fetch quests, and the side missions that aren't just don't feel all that well written, outside of one or two that stick out to me as some of the most interesting stories in this game. Between these issues, a mediocre final boss and some real head scratchers revealed near the end of what is an otherwise pretty good story, I believe that Horizon Zero Dawn is a beautiful, well-playing game with elements that just don't cross the finish line all at the same time. Number 21 I fell out of love with Call of Duty after Modern Warfare 1. When I was in high school, I thought that Infinity Ward leaned a little too hard into the gamer bro culture with all of the Doritos, Mountain Dew, 420 MLG no-scopes, and other such stuff. But now that I'm a fair bit older, I realize that that stuff has no effect on what is still an absolutely fantastic game series. So, when Sony so gracefully bequeathed Call of Duty Black Ops 3 onto my PlayStation Plus account, I gladly accepted because I would have forgotten just how much I missed this series. When I booted up Black Ops 3 for the first time, it was like I was slipping back into an old pair of shoes. The gunplay felt as tight and as satisfying as I remembered it. Learning map layouts and outflanking opponents in multiplayer warmed my heart in a strange but familiar way. I don't think they quite nailed the implementation of wall running and jetpacking, considering other FPS games that have done the same thing but much better. Everything felt just as I left it, except for the story. Modern Warfare 1's campaign is my all-time favorite FPS campaign. It was gritty, grounded, and impactful, and Gaz, Price, and Soap were way better characters than they had any right to be. So what the hell happened between then and now where both Black Ops 3 campaigns are jumbled, Inception-esque messes? The mission design of the campaigns are pretty good, but the main campaign got so hokey that at one point it began to border on so bad it's good territory, eventually landing on straight-up bad territory with some weird decisions they make in the back half of the narrative. Lastly, Zombies is a game type that I hadn't played in a good hot minute either, and while that's not exactly my cup of tea, I can recognize it as a fun time waster with friends that has more depth, hidden mission objectives, and love poured into this one mode than most other games, period. But despite my issues with the campaigns, I think that Call of Duty Black Ops 3 was a pleasant surprise and a welcome reintroduction to a series that I had long forgotten. Number 20 I had some good times with each game on this list so far, but number 20 is where you'll start seeing games that are a joy to play and look at. Rayman Legends is a well-crafted platformer that had a penchant for getting me to smile with its forward-thinking approach to platformer level design. From outrunning a falling tower in a desert, to thwarting an underwater security system, to participating in a symphony of chaos, destruction, and platforming to Ram Jam's 1977 hit Black Betty in one of the best implementations of music in any game I've ever played, Rayman Legends never seems to run out of surprises and even continues to ratchet up the difficulty in a way that never felt unfair. The only stumbling block that Rayman Legends hits is when they introduce Murphy, a controllable companion that shifts special platforms and clears blockages with a push of a button en route to the completion of a level. Murphy levels are way too plentiful. They are some of my least favorite in the game because using Murphy feels clunky and put a layer of distance between me and Rayman that just didn't need to be there. 
Thankfully, convenient checkpointing always dropped me off mere moments away from my last death, and all of the levels are all chocked with hidden nooks and crannies that hold some of my most fun platforming experiences anywhere. If you're on the fence about picking this game up, I definitely recommend it. It has a co-op mode, and if you're looking for a great party game or couch co-op experience, I definitely recommend giving Rayman Legends a shot. Number 19. Earlier this year, I stumbled upon the YouTube channel of Asai, a clone hero YouTuber who blazes through nearly impossible songs with the greatest of ease. Watching a few of this guy's videos helped me bring me back to my own experiences with the Guitar Hero franchise. It brought me back to a time of yore, and I decided to give Clone Hero a shot. After searching for weeks for a PC-compatible Guitar Hero controller, I was finally able to land an Xbox 360 Explorer, and I was off to the races. I went on to the Clone Hero subreddit, downloaded a few song packs, and booted up the game, and was teleported back to 2006, when I was first learning how to play Rush's YYZ on Expert, thanks to Freddy W. Nostalgia aside, this is basically the ultimate version of any Guitar Hero product ever. Because of Clone Hero's dedicated community, any song that you can think of likely has a compatible chart that you can play in this game. The hit windows are just lenient enough to where you're not missing notes that you feel like you should hit, and all of the options are laid bare for you. Whereas Hyperspeed and the other Guitar Hero games were regulated to a hidden code, and lets you adjust the highway speed with the press of a button. But by far my favorite option is the No Fail mode. It's turned on by default and really lets you goof around and have fun with some really evil songs instead of flunking out in the first few notes. Clone Hero lets you play all the way through to every song to the end, no matter how well you do. And hey, if you like failure, that option is still there. Finally, Clone Hero has expanded my taste in music. Whereas I may not have enjoyed listening to Lil Uzi Vert's EXO Tour Life by itself before, Clone Hero helped me engage with the music in a way that really made me appreciate this and many other songs in its infinitely vast library of community-charted tunes. Number 18 Her Story is an innovative, full-motion video murder mystery that asks the player to find their own way and ask their own questions through a tight, intriguing, and sometimes gut-wrenching story-driven experience. One of my favorite aspects of her story is in the way that the narrative is laid out. The entire game takes place on an information archive where you search keywords to pull up video clips of a woman named Hannah Smith, who is being interrogated in connection with the murder of her husband. Viva Seifert's performance as Hannah Smith is easily the highlight of the game, because even though her story is well written, it falls apart if Seifert doesn't bring an air of mischief, uncertainty, and flexibility to her role. As I delved deeper and deeper into the game's multitude of video clips, I began to solidify an understanding of who this person is, why she was being interviewed, and more about her... story. But when it seemed like I had all of the answers, and when it seemed like I was ready to draw my own conclusions, there was still another clip, still another keyword, and still another trail of breadcrumbs that caused me to wonder if everything that I understood was being turned on its head. In many ways, her story is the equivalent of slowing down on the road to get a better look of a traffic accident. You want to see the damage to the vehicles, you want to piece together how the accident happened, but you feel bad for the people involved. And it's something you can't look away from, and something that'll be in your mind long, long after the experience is over. Her Story is a game that I sort of picked up on a whim for fairly cheap, and I'm glad I did, because this game delivered an atmospheric, surprisingly thrilling roller coaster of an experience, and not to mention that this is easily the best looking emulation of a CRT monitor that I've ever seen on a flat screen. Honestly, it's worth the price for that alone. I probably had to pop out and get something, that's why I'm speeding. And that wouldn't have been noted on my timesheet. But I really can't remember back to February. Number 17. I freaking love baseball. It's the best sport in the world and there's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. And in keeping with the spirit of that last sentence, the sport of baseball also has the best sports video game on the market, thanks to Sony San Diego Studios and MLB The Show 18. In this year's edition of the show, the developers took last year's new edition of in-air ball physics and tweaked the math to produce more varied, logical, and interesting interactions between ball and bat. SDS fixed some nagging issues with fielders not tagging out base runners, solved some issues with fielding AI, and provided the single-player road to the show mode with its biggest update in years. 
Gone are the days of progression points that you assign to your player, and in is the era of game-by-game -game performance based progression. That is a smart, forward-thinking move, and I can't wait to see how they improve in the show 19. Now, even though this is the best sports video game on the market, the show is lower on this list than it usually would be because of a few issues with the overall package, such as no new legacy stadiums, changes to the Diamond Dynasty mode that made it much grindier than in years past, and a sometimes busted plate coverage indicator in online games that made offense much more of a roll of the dice than it should have been. But even with those issues, the Show 18 is still the best looking, best feeling, and best playing baseball game ever made, and they continue to raise the bar and make improvements year over year. So I'm expecting the Show 19 to be slightly higher than 17 on my 2019 list. Number 16. So, full disclosure, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a game that spans anywhere from 40 to 80 hours depending on how much side content you do. It's a massive, massive game, and I'm telling you this because I got about 6 hours in before I had to stop to write this review. So to compensate, I'll give you my impressions on what I played so far, and my impressions on how I played Assassin's Creed Odyssey on the Google Project Stream Beta. Streaming video games over the internet like Netflix has been a pie-in-the-sky initiative for technology companies going back to things like OnLive and Gaikai in the early 2010s. I can remember playing a streaming beta of Bulletstorm in college and thinking that while the technology was cool, there was a long way to go to make game streaming viable. But now that speedier internet connections have begun to seep their way into the average American home, it seems like the race is on to give consumers a lagless video game experience using nothing but a browser window. Enter Google, who gives away copies of Assassin's Creed Odyssey to play over the internet through their Project Stream service. So does Google's video games on-demand service actually work? Yeah. I was pleasantly surprised when I booted up Assassin's Creed Odyssey and found that the input lag was about on par with playing on a slightly too large television that may not be geared for playing video games. I was able to play the game without issue for hours at a time and never got a service interruption or a stretch of bad lag that brought my experience down. On the other hand, you can definitely tell that you're playing a game from some server in California, because while my inputs were being resolved on screen in a more than satisfactory time, areas with dinch foliage reveal some artifacting and blurriness that you usually see on Twitch streams that were encoded at a higher bitrate than you could handle. But how does the game play? I thought what I played was fun, and I hadn't played an Assassin's Creed since Brotherhood, so the shift from Rome to a world that was so huge and densely packed with loot, quests, and story was quite a jarring change. Personally, I'm having a blast with the mercenary system that sends named bad guys after me if I cause too much of a ruckus. There were times when I'd be fighting to take down a fort and all of a sudden this big mini-boss comes charging at me, throwing another obstacle in my way. It's a neat innovation on the wanted level system that you see in so many games these days. The performance from the voice actor that played Cassandra is fantastic from what I've seen so far, and I'm really digging the naval combat. ACO is probably the game with the most wiggle room on this list. It's only number 16 because I did need to write this video, but I think that once I put more time into it, Assassin's Creed Odyssey could end up jumping a few spots. Number 15. I never did have any sort of love for the PS2. I never owned it, I knew maybe one or two people that did, and the games that I played on the system never really encouraged me to get one, even though it does have the best wrestling game of all time on it. So it was fairly easy for me to miss Ratchet and Clank. So when the 2016 remake of the first game came through my PlayStation Plus subscription, I thought there was no time like the present to give this neglected franchise a fair shake, and yeah, it's really good. The environments are gorgeous, the platforming is tight, and the weapons are innovative, weird, and fun to use. I personally had a real soft spot for Zircon Jr., the cutest little murder bot in the universe. The upgrade system I thought was ingenious, as it unlocks upgrades and potential for your weapons as you use them, which tailors the entire game to your playstyle. Some of the clink puzzles later in the game were a bit of a drag, and the cutscenes did feel disjointed as they were taken directly from the Ratchet and Clank movie, but outside of that, the rest of the game is just an inspired series of design choices that work together to bring PS2 era 3D platforming to a new age, and I'm just really happy that I was able to experience it. Number 14. Full stop, this game does not work if the soundtrack isn't dope. 
Fortunately, Danny Baranowski is no stranger to dope sounding music as he created a pumping soundtrack for an equally as pumping rhythm based roguelite game. Because you can only move with the beat of the music, learning the rules of Crypt of the Necro Dancer's world and combat becomes a fun exercise in experimentation. And when you finally feel like you have those rules down, the game quickly sends you into, oh my god, this is so hard, territory. As a fan of these types of games, I found it incredibly easy to give my full concentration to Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Not just because this game basically demands it, but because of so many of the little things that feel thought out and contribute to this game's celebration of its fantastic tunes, like the enemies dancing along with the beat of the music, the shopkeeper singing along, even sometimes improving upon the track that's already playing, the rush of the song winding down and trying to make a break for the stage exit so you aren't caught out in the middle of a level at the end of a song and end up losing your multiplier. With a ton of content, multiple characters, devious bosses, and a banging soundtrack, Crypt of the Necro Dancer boogies in at a strong number 14 on this list. Number 13. I've never really been all too interested in the Yakuza series, I never really quite knew what those games were about, how they played, and never had a console that was able to run it until I got a PlayStation 4. I received Yakuza Kiwami and instantly regretted all of the years that I wasn't able to give my main man Kiryu the love and attention that he deserved. I say as much because this game is likely my biggest surprise this year, and I had no idea what to expect out of it going into my play sessions. But what I got was an incredibly fun beat-em-up that once you get past some initial jankiness, has a combat system with more depth than I ever expected it to have, a world that features one of my favorite representations of modern day Japan in any media that's chock-a-block with tons of goofy side activities from karaoke, baseball, bowling, board games, and whatever the hell this is. This is all strung along with a really engaging Japanese melodrama about the hidden, seedy underworld of the Yakuza that I am really enjoying, thanks to an amazing Japanese to English localization. Lastly, let me talk about one of my favorite characters in any game that I've played this year. Kiryu Kazuma, the dumbest, goofiest, most lovable lump of a tough guy that there's ever been. This guy takes everything about his insane life and internalizes it with a stoic seriousness that I just can't get enough of. Whether it be singing his entire heart out in the karaoke booth or beating up his rival for the 20th time, who is another incredible character in his own right, Kiryu is up there with some of my favorite characters from this year in gaming. The thing that excites me the most about Yakuza Kiwami is the idea that popular opinion puts this game below Yakuza 0, 6, and Kiwami 2. So if I'm having an absolute blast with what is apparently the least best new Yakuza, I can only imagine how much more fun I'm going to have with the others. Yakuza Kiwami has the attitude and self-parody that it needed for me to attach to this list as my 13th favorite game that I played this year. Number 12. From the cradle to the cradle. They say Rubin is racing, and if that's the case, Wreckfest would win the award for most racing in a video game hands down. Made by the developers of the Flat Out series, the title formerly known as Next Car Game, supports one of the best physics engines of any game I've ever played. I could spend all day running through tires, fences, and other cars just to see how Wreckfest resolves the chaos. And as a matter of fact, that's something that I've done a bunch of in the sandbox mode that comes free with the purchase of the game. Every car in Wreckfest handles like a reclaimed piece of junk, which is actually the reason why this style of off-the-road rally racing because every car drives like they're one or two puffs of air away from falling apart, races are always just the right amount of challenging. The only thing keeping you from winning at a 12th place finish is your consistency, and whether or not you flip your car on a big rock on the last turn of the track. They could probably pad the rest of Wreckfest out with some flat out style, launch the driver at a gigantic dartboard type of minigames, but with the extras that are here, they're still pretty great. Trying to survive a death race where you drive a three-wheeled monstrosity while your opponents are all driving buses, a lawnmower race on a figure eight track, and on and on, Wreckfest is a blast to play no matter if you're in it for the rubbing or the racing. Number 11. If I were to do a list of my favorite games of all time, Undertale would probably be up there in the top five. 
The music, atmosphere, characters, conflict, and narrative caused me to be one of those annoying people that pestered most of my friends in a desperate attempt to get them to play Undertale. Deltarune is the next step in Toby Fox's weird universe featuring animals, people, animal people, and a lot more. While it's a bit unfair to directly compare Deltarune, a demo to a game that may never actually come out, to the fully complete Undertale, I still found the former to be a great evolution of the latter, with a more engaging combat system, better visuals, and my personal moment of the year where I built a machine to, quote, thrash my own ass, unquote. While I don't think the first hour of Deltarune sticks quite the same way as Undertale's opening did for me, Deltarune eventually opened itself up to have as much heart, as much wit, and as many laughs as the first chapter equivalent of Undertale did. To me, Deltarune was the video game manifestation of that warm feeling you get when you see a group of old friends for the first time in a long time. Even though there have been changes, some scary, some welcome, it was good to catch up with the gang again, even though they take much more of a backseat in this title. Deltarune Chapter 1 has a ton of nods to directions that Toby Fox can take this new game in subsequent chapters, and man, it's making a potentially years-long wait just unbearable. All I know is that with an ending like that, I hope that stupid dog is up to his snout and work trying to figure out how to release the rest of Deltarune, because if not, that would just be so evil. Number 10. Much like Dead Rising, Metal Gear Solid is a game series that I adore. The characters, settings, and distinctly Japanese takes on American society is what helped these games stick in my mind as some of the most unique game narratives of all time, but that comes with a caveat. I actually don't care much for the gameplay of either series. That's not to say that they don't play well, but I'll just say that I'd rather watch someone else play them than play them myself. That's why Metal Gear Rising Revengeance came to me as a great surprise. Platinum Games did what Platinum Games does best and replaced the traditional sneaking gameplay of the Metal Gear franchise up to this point with some of the boldest, most satisfying hack and slash gameplay I've ever played. I felt like each time I picked up the sticks, I was learning more and more about the game's systems, combos, and enemies, and while I've always been a big fan of Raiden, this is probably the game in which I enjoyed him the most, because while Metal Gear is known for being cheesy in a melodramatic way, Revengeance, while still dramatic, goes for it in the total opposite direction by being cheesy in an off-the-wall, madcap, glorious way. Because when the butt-rock lyrics kick in during an intense boss fight that sees you slicing your way through a million pounds of robot, absolutely nothing comes close. Revengeance is one of the very few games that I played this year that knows what it wants to be, executes on that desire, and doesn't overstay its welcome. It's an adrenaline-filled joyride with the best elements of the spirit of Metal Gear, and I am so happy to give it the first spot in my top ten. You, well, you may have a metal body Excuse me. made of magnets, but you know what I have? A box. A box. <laughs> I avoided it! Oh my god! <laughs> Number 9 You might remember me discussing Dragon Ball Fighters earlier this year when I was talking about how it ate Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite's lunch. Now that we're a few months removed from that realization, I can still say that not only was DBFZ eating MVCI's lunch, it's now consumed its dinner and its breakfast the next morning. In bringing Dragon Ball Fighters into the world, Arc System Works has taken one of the most beloved animes of all time and given it the respect and reverence it deserves while still creating a fighting game for both casuals and hardcore fighting game fans alike. It's one of the best looking fighting games I've ever played, and while I'm a lot more of a casual fighting game player than I used to be, this title brought me back to the days of daydreaming in college, theorycrafting different combos and chomping at the bit to get back to my dorm and play some more. While the story mode does get a little long in the tooth, I was able to use it as a training ground for almost every character in the game, which helped me realize that there are obviously some top tier characters in Dragon Ball Fighters, but every member of this cast has at least a few tricks up their sleeve. 
Even Krillin, widely considered to be one of the worst characters in the game at the time, was a lot of fun to play, with his tricky moveset and high potential for mix-ups. Combos are satisfying to pull off, special moves look and feel as good to use as this title's namesake demands them to be, and even getting slaughtered by a friend who's much better than you is still incredibly fun in the right context. Dragon Ball Fighters is the best fighting game that I played this year, but I hope they can just get their tournament situation settled before it's too late. Number 8 Is it weird to say that a $40 Tetris game was one of the best purchases I made this year? That's how I felt about Tetris Effect, one of the finest visual and auditory delights that I played in the year of 2018. Tetris Effect is on a whole nother level with beautiful visualizations, fantastic musics, and a great uplifting message. Anytime in the last few weeks that I decided to sit down with the game to brush up for this video, I usually just found myself reverting back to Tetris Effect, because it is just that good. And yeah, while it is just Tetris, it is one of the best versions of the puzzler that you will ever experience, with concessions towards casual players like leniency on the infinite spins and modes specifically targeted towards expert players like Master Mode, everyone can find something to enjoy in Tetris Effect. For me, there are few experiences this year that rank higher than finally completing the absolutely phenomenal final level of this game's Journey Mode. This game is jammed packed with really good alternative modes that challenged me to actually get better at Tetris, by learning what a T-spin is, how to anticipate my next piece, and how to dig myself out of a Tetris-sized hole. All big steps for me considering that this was a game that I always thought that I would just be merely okay at. I don't see myself playing Tetris Effect for much longer because at a certain point, you just kind of become one with Tetris. And I just can't wait for the human Tetris symbiote, which is why Tetris Effect lands at the Octris spot on this list. Number 7 Yoko Taro asks one simple question. What does it really mean to be human? Part shoot 'em up, part character action, and part RPG, Nier Automata asks, answers, and expands upon that question with a generational story-driven video game that packs quite the emotional punch. This is a game that is intensely aware that it is indeed a video game, and that frees it to break basically all storytelling traditions. You won't get the full story on the first, second, or third playthrough, but instead, Nier Automata trusts you, the player, to piece together everything you know about these characters, these robots, and this world to make sense of its existentialist tale. While I think that the main plot isn't quite the galaxy brain genius that everyone else seems to think it is, I still think it's good enough, but the side missions are really where the game shines. For example, I really enjoyed delivering love letters to a suave ladies man robot, helping a karate robot get stronger through fighting and fetch questing, and watching a rendition of Romeo and Juliet where the participants didn't quite get the idea behind Romeo and Juliet. And that's the thing that sticks out most to me, because these are all just robots. Sure, some may have a little decoration here and there, but they're all the same enemies that you spend most of your time fighting out there in the world. But the way they infuse these metal husks with personality through Nier Automata's fantastic writing really sets this title apart from anything else that I played all year. And this is only amplified by my feelings for Pascal, who holds the distinction of having the best character arc of any character from a game that I've ever played. While I don't think the story or open world is really anything to write home about, I do think that Nier Automata sets itself apart with some of the best writing of this generation in video games. Number 6 so now we go from Nier Automata, a game rich with story and deep meaning and existentialism, to this. God, man, I played Horizon, then Pyre, then Nier, so you better believe that jumping down into the depths of hell to rip and tear some demons was such a great palate cleanser. Doom 2016 is a throwback in the best way possible. The map design harkens back to the sprawling labyrinths of 1993 and is packed to the brim with secrets, nooks, crannies, and everything in between. Doom brings an intensity to its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that always kept me feeling like the powerhouse that the Doom Slayer is. And the amount of characterization that they give to the friggin' Doom guy, a generic space marine that just kind of gets stuck on Mars, really pushed this game over the top for me. 
I absolutely loved wrecking demons with what I thought was somehow a well fleshed out character. And one of my favorite moments in the entire game came when I was in hell listening to the demons who live there tell their children about the tale of the Doomslayer. I had goosebumps thinking about how cool that idea was that even demons had their demons. And hey, their fears aren't exactly unfounded. Because enemies with hitscan weapons are somewhat rare, speed is a killer here, forcing the Doom guy to make use of terrain and wits to survive the demon onslaught. I was a big fan of the glory kill system that forced players to press forward if they wanted refills of their health and ammo. And lastly, Doom wouldn't be Doom without amazing weapon feel. The weapons are unabashedly aggressive from the power-packed pistol to the very explodey rocket launcher and BFG. Doom is a treat, a sweet, sugary burst of fun, a breath of fresh air. You can tell that this is a game that id Software had been wanting to make for a long time. They treated Doom with the respect it deserved and the game was so much better for it. In every aspect from music to weapon sound design to enemy encounters, Doom always kept surprising and turning the intensity dial all the way to 11. Number 5 I'm not really much of a superhero kind of guy, the Supermans, Batmans, Captain Americas really don't do much for me. I also never played that one Spider-Man game on the PS2 that everyone really loves so much, but as soon as I suited up into Insomniac Games' Spider-Man, it finally clicked for me and now I think that I would consider myself to be a bona fide Spider fan. This game easily has one of the most fun traversal systems in any game I ever played. Swinging around a huge and well-realized New York City was an absolute blast and kept me engaged during my entire 20 to 30 hours of playtime. I never felt the need to quick travel because I was always just having so much fun whipping around from building to building, saying hi to my adoring fans, and taking in the sights. Every time that I was heading to a main story mission, I would look at the map and think to myself, yeah, okay, that backpack is only a few miles away, I'd be losing time if I didn't go get it right now. By the time the third act started, I had every backpack, every radar tower, most of the bases, crimes, and challenges done. You know, I've heard some critics say that Spider-Man's open world is paint by number as far as open worlds go, but if this is paint by number, I really want to know what kind of coloring book they're using because I had a ton of fun simply being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Initially, I was going to dock this game a few points because I thought the combat was a bit too Arkham-y for my tastes. But the further I got into the upgrade trees, the more I found depth in using webs to pin down my enemies, neutralizing big guys, whipping rockets to cinder, using air combos to keep my focus meter up, and sometimes being stealthy. Experimenting with the different suit powers and upgrades kept fighting fresh, and even though Web Blossom is always a bit overpowered, really overpowered, I eventually realized that there was more than met the eye in the combat department. As far as the story goes, I thought that too was really good, if not a bit backloaded in the third act. Insomniac shook up the Spider-Man lore in a few key ways, like skipping the origin story, putting Peter into his mid-twenties, and having his relationship with MJ being a bit worn down. Peter Parker's quippiness never really got old for me, but when the story got serious, and believe me, it gets pretty damn serious, the story felt like it was punching above its own weight, giving a serious side to some historically silly characters. I had so much fun with Marvel's Spider-Man to the point where I will confidently say that it has well earned its spot in the top five of this list. Number four. I am 26 hours into Dead Cells and I've beaten the final boss exactly zero times. This game is freaking hard but there is something about it that keeps me going back for more punishment every time I die again and again and again. It could be because of the amazing variety of weapons I have at my disposal. Each one has their own specific strengths and weaknesses. For example, the crossbow delivers devastating damage up close, but takes a second to charge up. Spears can crit when enemies are pinned against walls. Whips do most damage at the tip. Swords are consistent, but a bit dangerous due to their short range and on and on and on. Dead Cells doesn't give a damn about how you like to play Dead Cells. They will throw enemies, situations, weapons, traps, and bosses at you and expect you to know how to handle yourself in those situations. And if you can't, well, it's back to the prisoner's corridors for you. The choices you make in Dead Cells matter and quickly shape every run you embark on. It's not like in Binding of Isaac where you pick up a bad item and you're stuck with it forever. 
You have every available opportunity to dig yourself out of any hole you put yourself into, but only if you, and you alone, are up for the challenge. Variety is the spice of life and death in Dead Cells. I always found myself exploring a little more to squeeze out a few more blueprints of a run so I can be a little more prepared for the next one. I took my time with new weapons so I could understand how they work within the rules of the game, and without fail, every time that I began a new run, I failed to finish off the final boss. But despite that, the controls still feel buttery smooth, the game feels fantastic to play, I'm still discovering secrets, still discovering blueprints, and really am enjoying the gameplay loop enough to keep on trucking, and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. Congratulations to the Dead Cells team on being my personal number one indie game of 2018. Number 3 I've barely scratched the surface of Monster Hunter World. Whereas my 40 hours of gameplay would afford me a platinum trophy or something close to it in most other video games, in Capcom's breakout hit of 2018, 40 hours puts me around halfway of the story with a few hundred hours to go to really get my fill of monster fighting goodness. The first few hours of my experience with Monster Hunter World came with me meticulously testing out each and every single weapon, trying to get a feel for just the right one. I didn't want to try anything too niche nor something too popular, so I settled on what I felt was the best option for me at the time. A big ass hammer. And through my experimentation I learned two things. Number one, the hammer is freaking sweet. And two, the weapons of Monster Hunter World are stunningly varied in a way that feels like you aren't just selecting a weapon, but a character from a fighting game with their own special moves, strengths, weaknesses, and playstyles. This game is teeming with incredibly complicated systems, upgrade trees, science research, and missions. This being my very first Monster Hunter game, it felt like I was being dropped into a foreign land with no understanding of the local language or customs. But when I finally broke through and really understand the core of what Monster Hunter is, it was a uniquely rewarding experience that made me work for the fun, which is something that I don't see in games too much these days. It was intimidating to step foot into the amazing ecosystem of Monster Hunter World, like I was setting out on a great voyage of knowledge and discovery and murder. But slowly I started to understand how to make the most of my time in the great unknown. I began looking for ingredients for crafting supplies, stopped burning my stakes, and got a lot better at fighting. I started using traps to my advantage, started capturing monsters instead of straight up killing them, now I feel like I'm a somewhat proficient hunter with the skills and knowledge to take down any dino or dragon that comes my way. But then I realize I'm only 40 hours into the game with the mid-tier hammer. There's so much more for me to do, and I just can't wait to get to it. Number 2 Bar none, God of War is the most successful reboot of an established game series there has ever been. From humble origins as an ultra-violent beat-em-up to an infinitely more measured, humble, and down-to-earth personal experience, 2018's God of War isn't only in the running for the best game I played this year, but is a contender on my favorite games of all time list. I think the moment that I fell in love with God of War came fairly early on. I was fighting a few baddies and wondered exactly how far I could push the limits of this game's combat system. After some experimentation, I quickly found myself pulling off insane juggles that string together launchers, axe swings, arrows, another axe throw, more arrows, and a devastating magical attack to finish it off. Every time a fight started, I was able to pull off cooler and cooler looking stuff and did it without the game telling me any of it. Lodging the Leviathan axe into one enemy to freeze them while I gave a prescription for Bofa to another made me feel like the biggest badass in all of the land. and. For reasons that I won't go into here, God of War continues to ratchet up the chaos later in the game when they expand combat even further. God of War is a story about a lot of things. Loss, fatherhood, coming to terms with the sins of your past, all of which this plot absolutely nails. Seeing Kratos as the old dude whose body was catching up to him, the stubborn old man who just wants to be the best dad he can be to a son he's desperately trying to shepherd was at times heartbreaking, relatable, and surprisingly human from a game called God of War. I'm not a father and don't plan to be one anytime soon, but after I was done with this game, I felt weirdly more prepared for fatherhood after watching Kratos adapt and change over the course of this game. A few more notes about how kick-ass this game is. 
The effort that it took to integrate Corey Barlog's vision of a single shot camera paid off in spades. It kept me deeply immersed into the game world with action pushing forward every second and smoothly guiding me from arena to arena. The world is beautiful, packed with detail, amazing side content, some rip roaring, knee slapping stories from the funniest comedian in all of gaming, Kratos. It was the story of the mother crab who scolded her son. She told him he should walk forward in pride, not sideways as he always did. But she's a crab too. He should say, sure, I'll look forward as soon as you show me how. Yes, he did say that. <laughs> That the story. I got it. Lastly, I wanted to give a quick shout out to my boy the World Serpent for making me feel incredibly small as a larger than life Greek god. But despite all of these pretty words, God of War isn't my favorite game I played this year. That honor goes to... Number one. No other game filled me with as much childlike joy than Titanfall 2. I thought the first one was a fine multiplayer shooter with some good ideas. I felt like if they expanded on story offerings while keeping multiplayer fresh, these kids over at Respawn could have something special on their hands and by God, that's exactly what they did. I love this game so much that I'd go so far as to say the story mode of this game is now my favorite FPS campaign of all time, finally dethroning Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Every second of Titanfall 2's campaign threw interesting challenges at me between wall running, double jumping, shooting dudes, calling down my Titan to shoot dudes, all with the best game feel of any game I think I've ever laid a hand on. Shooting feels, looks, and sounds strong, Titans feel heavy and powerful, and oh my god, I love this game. The level design gets an extra special nod from me here because while some games give you the tools to have fun, they usually don't craft a world around those tools. Some games give you a great setting while lacking in the gameplay department. Titanfall 2 nails both of those aspects. The levels are meticulously crafted to keep you engaged while delivering some incredibly cool environmental storytelling. Playing through a factory level and being along for the ride while an entire house gets built around me is one of the coolest ideas for an FPS campaign level that I've ever seen. The other one comes a bit later in the game where you get a time-traveling wristwatch where you can jump back and forth from the past and present to do cool-ass parkour stuff. I can't say enough about how satisfying it was to be faced with the wall of enemies in the present, blink to the past, walk to the other side of the room, blink back to the present, and shoot them all in the back because time-space just works that way. I think the narrative is serviceable, but not particularly long. I still really liked the relationship building between the protagonist, Cooper, and BT. BT, I found Anderson. He's, uh, in the ceiling. Objective complete. We have rendezvoused with Major Anderson. That's cold, BT. Correct. Anderson's current temperature is 17 degrees Celsius, below the threshold of human survival. There were some smart changes to multiplayer made as well. Titans aren't as beefy as they used to be, and they give some pilots more tools to use while fighting against the mechs. There's not many moments better than lassoing onto an enemy Titan, stealing their core, and then grappling to your mech to save it from death. Finally, the progression and constant stream of stuff I unlocked as I continued playing helped me feel like I was playing Call of Duty 4 again. And, in a nice bonus for everyone, there's no predatory monetization schemes here. If you want a skin, you pay for it. Nary a loot box in sight. Titanfall 2 didn't sell well because the geniuses at EA decided to release it sandwiched between Call of Duty and Battlefield. You can find it on sale these days for less than 10 bucks if you take a look around and I guarantee that it will be the best $10 that you've ever spent. I want more people to play this game because it is simply the best shooter I've ever played and the best game that I played this year. Hey everybody, if you made it this far, I just wanted to say a heartfelt thank you so very much. This YouTube project has been an absolutely stunning thing that I would have never expected to happen to me. Um, I'm almost at 10,000.
10,000 subscribers. That is 10,000 more subscribers than I've ever had to anything in my life. Uh, so, yeah, I would, I'm would. i really, really appreciative. I made that MVCI video when I was in kind of a creative rut, and there was something about fighting games, which I'm passionate about, coming up, so I decided to make a video about it. And you guys watched it, and you guys liked it, and you guys clicked and liked and watched and commented. and uh, It's really, really cool. So... Uh, my New Year's re my New Year's resolution is to have at least one video every single month for the duration of 2019, so you have a lot more stuff to look forward from me, and uh, I look forward to the response from you. So once again, I can't thank you enough. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be doing this today. Um, and uh, yeah, I just uh, can't wait to see what we do in 2019. So I'll see y'all then.